Mystery House. Mystery House, that strange publishing firm owned by Dan and Barbara Glenn, where each new novel is acted out by the Mystery House staff before it is accepted for publication. Mystery House. Come right in, Art. We're just about ready to start. Hi, Mrs. Glenn. Where's Dan? He was called out of town on business, a publisher's convention. Uh-oh. I know all about these conventions. So do I, Mr. Hearn. That's why I loaded him down with so much work he won't have time to draw a deep breath. Say, hey, speaking of deep breaths, have you ever noticed how important breathing is to a radio announcer? In what way? Why, you have to breathe deeply to make your commercial announcements sound natural and easy. Take this, for example. Everybody in your places. Set the scene, guys. Death at Deadline. Tonight's story opens in the private office of Luke Chilton, managing editor of The Star. One of his reporters, Pamela Carter, enters to announce an unwelcome caller. You have a caller, Luke. Oh, yes, Pamela. I'm busy with Deborah right now, making the dummy on page one. The same old caller, Luke. You don't mean Jim Bullen. The same. He always comes when I'm busy and he knows a damn well. I'll tell him you're not in. No, that won't do. He knows I'm in. Look, Luke, why not give him the bum's rush? Just because he was a reporter on the star and you fired him. Oh, it's him not that I'm soft, Pam. I feel sorry for the guy. He could have been a good reporter if he... If he hadn't had a heart full of larceny. Why, you'd have lost your own job if you'd let him get away with the kind of shakedowns he was pulling. No respectable people. I know, I know. Show him in. You are too soft, Luke. We'll see you, Jim. Thanks. Oh, uh, don't run on my account, Pammy. Hello, Jim. Busy as a little bumblebee, aren't you, Luke? I am busy, Jim. And, um, a little hard up. Ten bucks is just about all I can spare. Skip it, Luke. Surprise. I'm not after money tonight. No? No. I've been thinking things over, and I've decided to come back to work for this guy. I'm sorry, Jim. You're a good reporter, but after what happened, well, it was blackmail, Jim. You suppressed the story for money. The whole staff knew about it. If I'd put you back on, I'd lose a respectable buddy in the plant. I always liked the star. If you're ready to get down to business and do a good reporting job, there's no reason why you can't get back to work. But not on this newspaper. But it's on the star I want to work for, Luke. You don't seem to understand. I'm sorry, Jim. Look, I've decided to go back on the star. And if you're smart, you'll take me. I told you I can't, Jim. If you don't, you'll be making a big mistake. Then it's a mistake I'll have to make. I'm giving you a chance, you're, Luke. You're giving me a chance. Now listen here. That's what I said. You fired me. I took my spanking like a little man. But I've decided the period of punishment's over. I'm back. No, you are not. You with your pious talk of blackmail. You know why you fired me just as well as I do. Do you think I ever fell for that blackmail gag? That was the truth. You fired me because you're in love with Pam Carter and you thought I was in the way. You can't talk to me like that and get away with it. I can't talk that way because you don't like to hear the truth. I was running you a close race with Pam till you fired Step me. Get out of here. I don't have to put up with this kind of talk. You've no right in here. No right in the star? Why? Because I was fired by you. But you're going to hire me again. You're wrong, Jim. Did wrong. Now get out of here. I'll have some of the boys throw you out. I'm getting back under the sky, back where Pam is. Back where I can straighten things out with her. And if I can't do it because you're here, I'll have to see that you're not here. You uh, think you can get my job? Go right ahead and try. I'm not talking about your job, Luke. I'm talking about you. I can get rid of you so easy you wouldn't believe it. Permanently. <laughs> Another day, another dollar. 
I'm heading for home and a little shut-eye. I'll uh, buy you a cup of coffee if you'll wait for me. No, thanks. I need to sleep. You stick around here till the first edition's off the press, and that means another half hour till. In the words of the old song, I'm tired and I want to go to bed. <laughs> well, don't say I didn't offer. <laughs> Good night, Sam. Good night, Lou. Oh, um, by the way, hmm? did Jim Bowling make another touch? Uh, no. This time he demanded his job back. Demanded his job back? Yeah. What? He must be crazy. Made all kinds of threats. I don't see why you put up with him. <laughs> well, see you tomorrow. Right, then. <laughs> well, might as well get out some notes to the city editor and the wire desk. Yeah. You want to see me? You're a little certain, ain't you? Yes, sir. Then I want to see you. Have a chair. I'll stand up, thanks. I talk better on my feet. What do you want? I'm Jeff Corklin. Oh, yes. We've uh, had a few stories about you, Mr. Corklin. But I never had the pleasure of meeting him. It ain't going to be any pleasure for you, Chilton. No? Huh? No. I got a tip you're letting loose on me in tomorrow morning's paper. Uh, then you've been misinformed, Corklin. Not that it wouldn't be a pleasure to have a story on you. You got it, all right. If you'd uh, oblige me with the facts... I'd be happy to print it. Don't try to bluff me, Chilton. You're blowing me wide open with a story about my gambling joint. You're wrong. If I ever get the chance, I will. But you don't figure in tomorrow's news. Not yet, at any rate. I'll believe you when I see the paper. Well, you won't have to wait long. The boys should bring me a copy in a couple of minutes. I'll wait. Who uh, told you there was going to be a story about you? That's none of your business. But I'm afraid it is. The people on this paper are telling out stories about the... Oh, it wasn't anybody who worked for you. I know how you feel about that. I got the same kind of trouble. Rats that give tip off. Oh, pardon me. Here's your paper, Mr. Shelton. Uh, thanks, Billy. You can uh, beat it now. Okay. Good night, Mr. Shelton. Good night. Yeah, ladies, Corklin. Look it over. Is it on the front page? I told you there isn't any story about you. You can start with the front page if you like. All right. You know, the paper seemed kind of dead without the war news anymore. A nice murder, huh? Say, I'll want to spend some time reading that one. Professional interest? Yeah. Hey, hey, what's this? Yeah. What are you trying to pull? Pull? I don't get you. This story about me, right in the bottom of the front page. About you? Listen up. Now? You think I can't read? <laughs> Jeff Corklin, number one hoodlum and gangster, is through. Tomorrow, the star begins a sensational expose of his operations, naming names, dates, and places. The star today accuses Jeff Corklin of crimes ranging from crooked gambling to murder. All of these charges will be substantiated in future articles. Files on Corklin have been built up over a period of months, and all the star's information will be turned over to any authorities who are interested. Today, the Tell star... Tell So you didn't know nothing about it, I huh? never saw the story before my life. What do you think you're talking to, a sap? Somebody's been playing tricks around here. Just a minute. Make a move for that phone, and I'll tell you. I just want to call the composing room. I've got to find out where that story came from. You know where it came from, all right. I tell you, I don't... Okay, wise guy. Take a look at all this information you say you got. I don't have any information. No, I. I think you're going to send me to the pen without my even raising a finger? Let's have it, Chilton. I don't have a thing I can... Oh, no? Not much. You'd put yourself right out on a limb like you're doing that story if you didn't have proof. Come across. That story never came out of this office. I'm getting kind of tired of listening to that kind of guff, Chilton. You ain't playing with a little boy. I mean business. Fool. Fool. Put down that gun. Get me that proof you're yelping about or I'll blast your head off. Now, where's the stuff in? Look around if you won't believe it. I'll look around, all right. There's nothing here. The longer you keep it from calling the composing room, the more papers are going out. You see, you got me right on a spot, don't you? Dope on a murder rap, huh? I don't know a thing about it. Somebody spilled it to you. One of my boys. Think you got me cold, huh? Well, let me tell you something, wise boy. I got you cold, too. This joint's deserted. Even the office boys left. Must be close to three o'clock in the morning. Nobody on the street. I can get away from here plenty easy. And I can fix up an alibi. Now, either you give me that information or I'm going to blow you right off of the map. You fool, you've got to believe me. I believe you, all right. I believe what you wrote in the paper. It says right at the top of the page. If you read it in the star, it's so. And plenty of other people will believe it, too. What have I got to do to convince you that I don't know anything about it? You couldn't do it, funny boy. First, I get a tip from a guy who knows what you're doing. He says certain things. I come here, and what he says checks. 
Everything checks except you. Okay, so will I. Do you so I can with you? What do you want me to do? Give me all that proof you say you got about me. But I don't have a thing. I'm getting kind of tired mucking around with you. Either come across me for I count of three or I'm going to blast you. One, two... Now look at me. Who gave you the tip? That might be important. The guy used to work for you. Still a friend of yours. A guy who spends a lot of time with you. Two. Jim Bolin. <laughs> He doesn't know a thing about what's going on around here. He sure know about that story. Turn on your stalling for time. One, two. All right, wise guy. Oh, you fool! You, you've been framed. You're the worst fall guy that. does Jim Boland, the ex-reporter, figure in this murder? And what good will it do him if it does him any good? We'll find out in the second act of tonight's story. Meanwhile, here's a message from our sponsor. And now... Act two of Death at Deadline. Jeff Corcoran has made a frenzied search of Luke Chilton's office without finding any evidence of his crime. He's just getting ready to leave. <laughs> Jim Boland. Yeah. Where do you think you're going, Corcoran? You ain't big enough to stop me, Boland. You I wouldn't reach for your gun if I were you, Corcoran. I won't hesitate to kill you and you're covered before you even get started. Oh, sure, you rat. You were the guy who tipped me off. Sure. You? Sure, I was the one. And I know what you'd do, too. What's the big idea? You thought I was working with you, didn't you, Corcoran? Well, I wasn't. I'll uh, take your gun, if you don't mind. No. I said I'll take it. Thanks. You tipped me off in a story. You told me how long to wait before I came up here so I'd get to talk to Chilton alone. Now you're trying to turn me in. What's it all about? Maybe I'll tell you sometime, Corcoran. Right now, I think I'd better call the police. Oh, Riley? Riley, this is Jim Bolin over at the Star. Bring over a couple of good strong boys. Yeah, I've got a murder for you, and it's a little tough to handle. No, no, I'm not joking. I said a murder, and that's exactly what I mean. Right. Goodbye. Why, you dirty double cross? Stand by, Kirkland. There's nothing I'd like any better than to shoot. You mean you were working on the star all this time? Sure. You know, Luke had an idea that no reporter could get the goods on Corcoran because the Hoods had every newspaper man in town spotted. So we planted that blackmail story about me and I got fired. At least that's what everybody thought. But you really were fired. You mean I was taken off the payroll? Sure. Luke was afraid there would be some loops in the office, so he really did it up brown. That's why I came in to borrow money from him so often. He was getting me the full amount of my check every week, and then he was going to get the money back from the paper once we broke with the story. But he seemed so convincing. I really thought... I know. Yeah, good old Luke. He could put on a good act when he had to. But he didn't even tell me. Pam, honey, that was one thing he really felt bad about. Now, do you know what tell me? No, about making me look bad to you. He figured he'd sort of broken things up between us. Said the first thing he was going to do after the story broke was square me with you. But Luke and I were in love with each other. We were going to get married. That bothered him too, honey. He said he was afraid you'd fallen for him and that, well, he just wasn't the marrying kind. But that's not true. Try not to be sorry, Sammy. He was putting on a show to get a whale of a big story. He was a newspaper man. But what happened to the story? 
What happened to all the information about Corcoran? The documents and things. Corcoran got them, of course. But the cops can't figure out how he got him out of the place unless he had one of his boys with him and sent him out before he shot loose. Oh, oh, Officer Riley. Hi, Riley. Uh, Corcoran took him down and told you where he gets the papers yet? No, but he's done better than that. He's confessed to another murder. Another murder? There's a foreman of the star composing room. Blue Herman Schultz. It seems kind of funny, Schultz leaving that note that had been called out of town right when a murder was taking place. But why would he kill the composing room foreman? Yeah. He says he went to this Schultz and asked him to keep the story out of the paper. Schultz wouldn't do it. So he got, got him outside and killed him. He was planning on going back into the composing room then and taking the story out himself. But he didn't know how to unlock the page for him. Did he uh, tell you where the body is? No, worse luck. That's what's burning me up. He tells us he's killed his shoots and then he sits and laughs at us. He says it's up to us to find the body. And we can't do nothing about it till we find the cop. That's right. You can't, can you? Here he is, but make it snappy. Hello, Miss Carter. Hello. Listen, Copper, what are you standing around for? I said I wanted to talk to the lady alone. All right, all right. But no tricks now. Well, Mr. Copper? Is that gag of yours about my telling the composing room foreman working? Right. The police have finally started looking for Herman Schultz. You know, it's kind of funny how things work out. What do you mean? Why, here you are hating me for killing your sweetheart and wanting revenge. And I hate Jim Bowling and want revenge. And the only way we can both get what we want is by working together. Somehow, Mr. Corcoran, I don't hate you as much as I did at first. You believe my story about what happened, huh? I know it's cool. Jim Bowling was just as guilty of killing Luke as if he'd pulled the trigger. It was that story. And everything depends on my hunch that Jim Bowling planted that story... Then picked you off. I was crazy sore when I seen it in the star. Being in print like that, and then I was all through. I lost my head. This was exactly what you were supposed to do. If the police would just find the composing room for them, stop. Baby, you don't even know he's dead. He has to be. The only way Jim could have planted that story was through Herman Schultz. And he couldn't just get him so soon. The guy left a note saying he was going away. But the note was typed. Bowling's silvier than me, but you can't touch him. We just to just find the body. There may not even be a body. There is. Somewhere. Corson, I just got to make Jim Bowling pay for killing Luke. So I'd like to help you with that job. I'll get Jim Bowling. Somehow. Somewhere. You know, baby, when you grit your teeth like that, I'd give you a job in my mob. If I was out. <laughs> for tonight, Sam. Going home? No. Um, I wish you'd stay a few minutes, Jim. Why? I just called Officer Riley. What for? I got some new evidence on Luke's murder. Look, honey, I wish you'd forget that murder business. It's all settled. They got Corcoran cold. What more do you want? They're still him and Schultz. You know something? I don't believe Schultz is even dead. I think Corcoran used his disappearance to mess things up. He knows they won't go to trial till they find Coach's body. That's a very interesting theory, which shows you don't know the facts. What do you mean? You'll see. Oh, there's Riley now. I come as fast as I could, Miss Carter. What's this all about, anyway? I want you to put Jim Bowling under arrest, Officer Riley. What? Huh? Oh, you're joking. I was never more serious in my life. Sam, what's this all about? It's your idea of a joke that's in rotten taste. It's not a joke. Do you think I believed you when you said Luke wasn't really in love with me? Eh? So you're sure about that? I never believed it for a minute. You hated Luke because he fired you. Because I left him instead of you. For a lot of reasons. You decided to kill him, but you didn't have the nerve to do it yourself. 
And you were much too clever for that anyway. Oh, Pam, please, don't be so melodramatic. You took Jeff Corcoran off that Luke was going to run an expose of Corcoran's racket. You told Corcoran to come in after the deadline, when there wouldn't be anyone else in the office. That's a beautiful story. And a cool one. Then you wrote that story about Corcoran. A threat to expose his whole set. Look, I wasn't even supposed to be working on the paper. I'd have had fun getting a story published, wouldn't I? That's where I'm going to get you, Jim. You had to enlist Herman Schultz's aid to get that story with the star. You told him some lie. Probably that Luke had edited it in. Once that story was locked up in the page form, you sealed Luke's death warrant. That's a nice theory, Pam, but you don't have an ounce of proof for it. That's right, Miss Carter. You've got to be careful about making such accusations. Oh, I don't mind, Riley. But I do have proof. I got the original copy of that Parker News story. And it wasn't Pike and Luke typewriter. Is that right now? Which doesn't prove much either, does it? I had a... Well, a friend of mine goes into your apartment, Jim. The type on your typewriter checks with the typing in the story. So what? So what? It means that you wrote this story. Well, what if it does? You killed it. You got caught him to come in to see him. You timed it. So we get there just before the paper came out with that story. You... What if I did? You can't hang a thing on me. I'm literally in the clear. Jeff Corcoran admitted killing his children. He did it. There's no argument there. You can't do a thing to me. That's what I wanted to hear you say, Jim. You can't tell me. had it coming to him. But I didn't kill him. You think you're awfully clever, don't you? Clever enough so that I wasn't going to involve myself in murder. And I didn't. I got what I wanted without taking any risk. You're forgetting one thing, Jim. One awfully important thing. I didn't forget anything. You're I... forgetting the murder of Herman Schultz. Remember? But he wasn't murdered, he... Oh, yes, yes, he was. Corcoran confessed to that one, too. Corcoran lies. He's using that as a stall to... Oh, hello, Joe. Got the first edition for it? Uh, yes, he's caught him right here. Thanks. Herman Schultz isn't dead. He... No. Take a look at the front page of the star, Jim. Let me see. Police found body of Star Foreman. The body of Herman Schultz, Star Composing Room Foreman, was found late last night by the police, a bullet in his temple. The police were baffled by the fact that the bullet was not from the gun of Jeff Corcoran, who had previously confessed to the murder. That puts a different light on things now. You were holding a gun on Corcoran when you called me over here to get him. I'd like to be taking a look at that gun, Boland. Maybe the ballistics department would be interested. Take that frame up. I didn't kill him and I'd like to see that gun, Boland. Better let him have it, Jim. No. No, you're framing me. You did this coming, Pam. You did it. That's you... right, Jim. Blame everyone but yourself. Hand over that gun, Boland. I... All right. Here. Sure. Sure, I'll get it. Tell you I'll get it. Try shooting at me, will you? Why, you dirty... Oh, oh yeah. yeah. I didn't kill him. I, I didn't kill anybody. Well, I had to do it. And I had to check his revolver against the body. You know, it's funny they didn't tell me over at the station about finding that body. Did you work in any case like I did? There isn't any body, Riley. What? No body? But it's his right here in the back. I know. That's the second time that the papers had a phony story. I thought there was a body, and I was hunting for it. I discovered that Jim had paid Herman Schultz to put that story about Corcoran in the paper. Paid him plenty. Schultz was hiding in Jim's apartment until this thing blew over. But if Schultz was hiding in Boland's apartment, then Boland knew he wasn't dead. Last night, I asked Jim if I could borrow his revolver. Said I'd been scared at him since murder. He let me take it. Early this evening, I returned it to him with one bullet fired. When he saw that story, he thought I'd framed him, just as he framed Luke. He could see the police checking the bullet and finding the pins in his gun. It never occurred to him that the story in the star was another fake. It may have been a fake, but it sure got results. Yes, it... I took care of things for Luke. I... I suppose I...